Now, I want to introduce our awesome speaker, Elena Haskins. Uh, I was chatting with Elena earlier, and uh, I have seen her like talk all over Techlahoma Slack, all over LinkedIn with, um, with her studio name, Anale. Is that, I pronounced that correct? Okay, Anale. Um, and um, it's, so, it's so awesome. Uh, I'm, as, as a developer, we integrate with, you know, we, we work with creative people all the time, and uh, especially for something that I'm passionate about, it's about hiring people who are new to the field and getting them trained up and giving those opportunities. And that's the thing I've seen her do all over the, the community, and that's just so awesome. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be uh, announcing Elena here. And now for as far as the script side of that, so introducing Elena Haskins, a seasoned senior UX designer and the mastermind behind Anale, a thriving UX studio. With extensive experience in a myriad of industries, Elena excels in simplifying complex systems and fostering collaboration among stakeholders. In her talk, Elena will unveil the power of object-oriented user experience, OOUX, uh, that process. This method acts as a bridge, enhancing cooperation between developers, information architects, and UX UI designers. Learn how OOUX facilitates early development, developer involvement, streamlines data modeling, and encourages continuous knowledge sharing. Discover how it paves the way for project consistency and early issue resolution. Everybody, let's raise the roof for Elena Haskins. Hey, thanks so much. Hello, everybody. We are just going to jump right in. So first, I want you to picture you walk into a coffee shop. And you're looking around, and you can't tell the difference between the chairs, the cups, the tables. You're like, that's kind of weird. I know they're in here. I know I'm supposed to be able to do something with them, but I have no idea what. And we accidentally create a lot of systems, software, apps, experiences like this, where we put some stuff in there. We're the experts, so we're like, oh, this is how it works. And yet our users look at them, and they're like, um, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing right now. What is the relationship? I'm in this coffee shop. Is this chair occupied? Is this the chair that goes with this table? Is this my coffee cup? Those are all those small relationships that people are constantly thinking about and we need to make sure we are accounting for. So we can turn this into this. I don't know where the cup went. Oh, it's, you can't really see. No, the chair, you can't really see it, but. Okay, so um, like, Aaron, like he said, um, my name is Elena Haskins and I run a UX studio. And so I'm gonna talk a lot today about object-oriented UX, something that I've found and realized it has changed the way that I think about products and working with developers and making sure everything actually makes sense from the start. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what is OOUX, what are the benefits, how can it make your life better, your life and my life better? How does it actually work? So when we put it into practice, whether you are a big team, maybe you're a freelancer, maybe you're just doing it for your own projects, what can you do to facilitate this so now you can make your projects more streamlined? And lastly, what are the outcomes? What kind of deliverables? When we walk away, what do we have and what can we show for it? So OOUX is a philosophy that UX designers, anyone, stakeholders, can use to really understand what are the pieces within the system. So I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with object-oriented programming. So it, okay, you can't really see it again, <laughs> but um, it has, it's very similar in the sense of identifying what the pieces are, but more for object-oriented programming, it's about the structure of your code. When we're thinking about OOUX, we're thinking about what are users more, what are they interacting with? So they're very similar, some of the terms are gonna overlap, the methodologies are gonna seem familiar, so that's actually a really good thing. Okay, so how can it make your job easier? Why are we even having this conversation? What, we, do we need another framework? Do we need another methodology? It's like stop throwing all that stuff at me. What I wanna do is I wanna make your life easier. So first is just better team alignment. How often have you been coding, you've been working on something, and then all of a sudden the stakeholders come back and they're like, we actually don't want to do that. Or the de designer's like, we totally forgot about this one thing, can you add it in? And now the scope is completely changed. And you're like, uh, yeah, we can. And they're like, can you do it in two days? And you're like, yeah. they're like, you have to do it in two days. <laughs> And now your, your work, now no one's happy about it. 
So the way this process is, is it brings everybody to the table in the beginning. Also, how many times, I, mean, I know for me, too many, have you been on a project where they say, oh, we are very collaborative. We like to work quick and together, and then that doesn't happen. It's just, oh, it's another waterfall, but we just put another buzzword on it. Okay, cool. But here, what we do is we actually invite people to all of these workshops, or even if you just have one, to get their kind of insight. So I've done them with people where you even have sales on there. You have the developers there. You have the designers. You have the person who's making those decisions. So when you get to the actual development and the design, those people aren't like, wait, that's not what I want. Those aren't the requirements. We actually have them kind of designing what those needs are in the beginning. So developers can start asking those questions and saying, wait, wait, what did you say you wanted? Because the designer might not know what those limitations are. And so they're like, yeah, 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 we could do that. Yeah, okay. They're talking to the lead um, stakeholder and they're like, oh, absolutely, we can add that feature for sure. And then the, and now we, you know, flash forward, the de developer's looking at it and they're saying, what? That's gonna take eight months, but we already promised it to the client. So, and we get into these situations all the time. So what if we do that in the beginning together so that doesn't happen? So just, and also the key thing to remember is we're talking about like the business objects. I know with object-oriented programming, you could have a million different like classes and objects. Um, that's like kind of the biggest difference is we call them objects, you call them classes. And with them we have instances. I'll get into that a little bit more, but I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Um, but we're talking about what are the business needs, what are the business requirements, so that everything that we're making aligns with the business needs, so no one's like surprising you later on saying, wait, that doesn't actually align with what the users need. The next is, how can we get you that data early and collaboratively? So I've, wor I've also worked on many projects where uh, you know, we're putting together all the wireframes, and then we give it to the developer, and now you have to reverse engineer them. What data do you need? Let me guess. Uh, and you have to look through the wireframes, you have to guess, or you have to go back to the designer and say, hey, what did you, what are the fields we need for this? Like, how can we get that structured? But with OOUX, the designers are part of that process to help define what that data is at the start. So before they even start creating any of those wireframes, they're already putting together those data requirements so your uh, backend developers can get started and start looking at that and saying, okay, this makes sense, this is how this connects to that. Um, okay, I know it's a little hard to see, but basically what I have on the left-hand side is something that I've put together for my developers where um, like first we have the product name, like what data field is it? So let's say product name. The second category is what field type? What field type would we have? Is it a rich field text? Is it a price field? Is it a media upload? Um, and then I have who, what the source is. Is the admin putting it in? Are we putting it in? Is it coming from like an API? How are we sourcing that data so you can actually set up the system to obtain it in the way that you need? The next we have requirements. So for example, like max characters, min characters. When we do have media upload, what can we accept? Is it just JPEG? Is it, can we have movies? Um, and then error messages. So what are the error messages that are gonna come up from the user's side when they don't hit those requirements. So we can make sure they are informed and then now you don't have to guess what those parameters are. Um, is it required? Is this attribute required in order to publish it? So can we move forward with you know, pushing it out if we don't have all this information? Um, and then next I just have a notes section and then privacy. So who can see this kind of information, which type of users, et cetera. So, oh, I forgot I made it bigger. <laughs> um, cool, we're just gonna keep going. Um, the next thing is just increasing the efficiency and removing tech debt. So what we see here is three instances of something on Meetup. And these are all for a user who's going to an event. So the first one is when they're looking at the calendar list. Hey, you're going, here's the name of what you're going to. Are you going yes or no? Um, on the home page banner, which is the second one, and then on the group page. Those are three things that you had to create, that I had to design, now someone has to maintain, representing the same exact thing. 
Why are we doing this? It doesn't have to be this way. The next is just uncovering use cases and questions to save time and money. So if, you're any, if you are like a product owner or you're someone who's scoping things, you know that that adds up. Every time we have to rework something because someone changes their mind, they didn't understand, or they start thinking of all these other situations or use cases, then they're like, hey, can we add this in? And you're like, not really. <laughs> or it's gonna be very expensive. And now everyone's a little like, ah, we just gotta get through this. No one's having a good time. So this is a huge thing that as we, you start breaking apart those pieces early, before design even starts, it starts to answer those questions. Um, and then improved user experience. I wouldn't be a good UX designer if I wasn't standing up here saying, we need to have a great user experience. And so for your perspective, we wanna have that because happy users means they're using it and there's less rework of the mistakes or things that we as a team missed. For me, as a UX designer, I'm a huge advocate for the user, so I want to keep them happy so they can have a more seamless experience. For the stakeholders, they're like, hey, we want to keep our customers and we want more money. So it's a win-win for everyone to have a better user experience. Okay, so how does this all work? Hopefully you're, you're on board a little bit. If not, hopefully this process will show you what does this actually look like in practice. So these, there are four areas where you're focusing on collecting those requirements and discovery. So first we have the objects. So like I said, in object-oriented programming, that is what you call classes. So, and then from the objects, we, we call them instances and you call those objects. But, um, so it's just what is important in your ecosystem? What can someone interact with? Um, so we're gonna start with that. Okay, so, and again, business objects. So it's like the coffee cup, the table, the chair. What is someone actually interacting with? The way that we define for OOUX what an object is, is it something that has structure, so it has those attributes that make it unique, it has many instances. So if it's just a one-time thing, like a menu, a menu is not an object. A menu is just like a list of other pages and pluralizable, there has to be the capability to have many of these. So for example, a game. Um, so the structure is what time is it, the place, is it a home team, who's the UA team? An instance could be the OKC U18 girls soccer team that's happening November 10th. So it's a very specific instance. And then there are many games that will be happening and that we need to account for if we are creating, let's say an app for a soccer game. What are not objects? So like a game schedule, a sign-up form, and a photo album are not objects. Those are collections of objects. So a game schedule is a collection of a game. A sign-up form is for player, and a photo album is actually just a collection of photos. So we want to get the lowest level of what that base is as we're going through these kinds of exercises. So the way that we find this is what we call noun foraging. So this is where we're doing that requirements gathering to see what is living in your system. So you could look at um, any kind of literature they have on the website, any kind of marketing materials, if there are any people doing any kind of publicity, what kind of nouns are popping up that people are talking about over and over again. So I'll literally go through and like highlight and then see that tally of, wow, okay, so this is something that I did for an app to help parents with their kids playing different sports, managing their teams, joining different teams. Um, and so I'm like, okay, these are the different nouns that I come across. And then we wanna narrow it down. So which ones are the most important? For larger scale projects, you absolutely could be doing this for all of them. If you were on like a quick pinch for time and you're like, hey, we need to keep this going. Maybe we need to focus just on a feature. You can just pick some of the core ones and do this exercise. It can, this whole process can be as big or as small as your team needs. The next one is relationships. How are all of these objects living in relationship to each other and what, like how do they affect each other? So let's say we have player. So first what I do is I'll make a matrix. You're gonna see a lot of matrices and a lot of tables. That's just the way my brain works. Um, and this is how I've just found it easy for people to like interact with what they're doing. 
So I'll line up the key objects at the top. And this is what we call the host objects. So everything we do will reference those. So let's say player. What is the relationship between a player to another player? So, a, so now we think about cardinality. A player has zero to many other players that they're friends with in this app. A player has many players that are on the same team. And so then it starts opening up questions like, okay, how, many, how are players even added as friends? Are they automatically friends if they are on the same team? Or do they have to go in and manually do that? Can players see other people's schedules? So now it opens up questions about privacy. Um, what does being a friend even mean on this app? Do we need another social media? Like what are those, what kind of constraints do we want to have on our tool? Can players message each other? Do we want to have messaging as a feature? Or do we want to have like their phone number? How does that play into privacy, especially if we're talking about kids? So it opens up all these other things that now design can talk to dev, who's also talking to the, the stakeholders, saying, do you even want to have these kind of things? And the stakeholder might say, oh, actually, we don't really want players to be able to message each other because of like privacy, maybe because they're, they're under 18, or there could just be a lot of things we didn't really think of that only the stakeholder might know of, and we, th we can't think about them until later. So like, let's map them out and think of an exhaustive list of what all of those relationships are so we can try to nip some of these things in the bud. So I've been in many situations where all of you save the day where I'm, the developer is like, hey, task from the show, like, hey, what about this? And I'm like, oh my god, how did we forget that? And then I would talk to some of the other designers, I was like, hey, what about this? And they're like, I can't believe we forgot that. <laughs> so as much as we love and appreciate all of you being able to like clean up our messes, I don't want you to have to do that. Um, here's one more example. So uh, what's the relationship between a team and a player? A team has many players on it, and so then it could have questions of, what are the minimum number of players required for the team? If the minimum isn't satisfied, what happens to the players that already signed up? Whose responsibility is it for the players to notify, uh, to notify the players if the minimum is not reached. So all of these like if then, if then, what, what's gonna happen? So I wanna make sure we're planning for that before it's uh, in development. Um, so then I basically do it for all of the objects. You wanna be very exhaustive. There's little blue cards, I know you can't really see it. This is an example of something I, that I was actually working on where the blue is representing all the objects and relationships. Um, and then, yeah, the white is all the questions. Okay, the next is call to actions. So this is, a call to action is the action someone's going to take on it, which I believe you all call methods for object-oriented programming. So this is where we wanna think, again, exhaustively, what are all the things that different kind of users are gonna be doing to your objects in the system? So, Here's our favorite matrix again. So we do it again, and I put the key personas at the top. So we have our player, parent, and coach. And the difference I wanna call out is, I see that we have to do player twice. So a player can be an object because it's also gonna be living in this app. A player might have a profile. People might need to add players to their teams. So that's a little bit different than a player as a user who's just using the app. Just because they're a user doesn't mean they have to be an object. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. So yeah, a player might wanna message another player. A player might wanna um, add a friend, a player as a friend, and then a player might wanna invite a friend to join their team. So I go through and we do this for everything. So the player, to what can a parent do to a player? What can a coach do to a player? Um, and the last thing are the attributes. So what is that data that makes all the instances unique? So uh, these are probably also very familiar. So it's listing them all out. So it's taking the steps that you all do and just making us do the work with you. <laughs> that's, that's what you'll probably see where you're like, we already do this, why are you telling us this? The point is, I'll do it with you so you have less to do and it's more collaborative. And then we're like, oh, okay. And I just wanna lighten the load so it's not just hey, you have to just come up with all this stuff on your own. So let's say we have a player. So I'm like, oh yeah, we gotta have first name, last name, phone number, school, the list goes on. 
And we can get these from those conversations with the stakeholders because we say, what information do we even need? Like, yeah, I could guess. Yeah, you probably need the name, the number. Do we even need the address? Why do we need the address? And maybe the coach is like, oh, well, like we need that for like s security reasons or whatever. Um, so we're like, oh, I didn't even think of that. So we can just add to the list. The next we reorder them and we start prioritizing and saying, hey, what is the most important and how is that gonna show up? If we had to cut something, what would we cut? Who can see these kind of things? What is the privacy around that? Privacy and permissions around these different types of information. Who's collecting that information? Okay, so now we have all of this. How does this even turn into designs? That's all fun and games. We have our requirements, but now what are we gonna do with it? So I'm just gonna give you, I'm not gonna talk too much about design, but I need to show you a little bit so you can see how it all connects together. So what we do is we, there's three kinds of, I guess, component pages. So there's typically always a list view, a card view, and a detail. A lot of things are just broken up into that way. And so what we'll do is we do kind of like a blocking wireframe. So we see the colors on the side, those are all the attributes. So I'll, I'll narrow down and say, and first just list and say, what are the top attributes that we need to know about the object? If I can only look at two, what, what would we pick? And it forces the stakeholder to actually make those kind of decisions. And it, does, it takes that responsibility off of you of guessing. And they're like, well, uh, I really want to have, you know, all 10. And we're like, okay, but we can't have all 10. What do you want? What do you need for this to be successful? And so then what we do is we start doing that in a visual way. So I start lining them up and doing this like blocking wireframe on the left side. And I actually just say, this is the wireframe of the information. So then when I start to do the actual visual part, uh, I know exactly what it needs to be, and it needs to be consistent. So if I'm looking at a player page on uh, their detail page, or I'm looking at a roster, the information isn't jumbled. Like, you shouldn't have age first on one, and age like fifth on another. That's really confusing for users, because now the information is jumping around. It's making them think more. And that's also just more work to have to have all these different types of iterations. So, this keeps it more uniform for the user and also just makes it easier for us to organize and just more efficient from a design perspective. I've now started doing this process and it speeds up my wireframes like in half because I can just think of it more methodically instead of trying to decide what order do things have to be in when I'm designing like, oh, should a button go here? Should it go here? But I'm mixing this, but also with um, the actions. Okay, what does this have to do with architecture? So this, I know it's also hard to see, this is a, a nav flow. So it's very similar to a normal information architecture, except it's playing on what are the relationships. How can I get from this page to this page, instead of it being really siloed? So a good way of thinking of a really great method of this working is Wikipedia. You never go to the nav bar to find things in Wikipedia. You, you're like, oh, da, 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 dog. And then it says, oh, a dog is a mammal. And you're like, oh, mammal, what's mammal? <laughs> and then you click into that, and then it leads you to another list, and you're like, amphibian. And it just kind of, you're staying in that experience based off of the content and navigating within that. That's like a really good user experience because then you're anticipating what people's needs are. And then from a data perspective, you're seeing what the relationship is between those pieces of information and using that as a navigation piece. So an example of like an app that could be really useful using this way of thinking in terms of like relationships is let's say you have an app that has a bunch of recipes from local chefs. And so I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh wait, ooh, I really love apple pie. And so I'm looking at that and then I'm like, ooh, th let's see what else the chef has. So if this doesn't work, a lot of times what you do is you have to now go to the chef page and like search for the chef. But it would be great if on that page you can click into the chef directly there. Now you're like, ooh, okay, I'm looking through. Oh, that's, 
that is really cool that he is, has a lot of steak recipes. Now I click into steak and I can see all the steak recipes. So I never have to leave the experience to find what I need. It's knowing what people are thinking because it's using their mental model because they're thinking in objects. They're thinking, they're not thinking, ooh, I want to search for this thing. They're saying, I want pie or I want steak or I want to learn about this chef. That's how people are thinking in, you know, when they're navigating into these kinds of experiences. Okay, let's say we want some more requirements. Everyone loves requirements. Every dev I talked to is like, ah, what about requirements gathering? So everything that we talked about is requirements gathering. Now let's say you have a little bit more time. So like I said, it is, it is a flexible process. So the first step of what I just showed you, I have been able to do that on, depending on how deep you wanna go, you can do that in like an hour and a half. Obviously, you're not gonna get as much information, but if you buckle down, you get all the right people in the room, you can crank out a surprisingly a lot of requirements in that one hour. Or my ideal time, if I have to do some short, is probably three and a half hours. Um, and I've also done like workshops where it's like uh, the three days of that. But you can kind of crank that out. But let's say you're like, you know, we actually have a little bit more time. Let's keep going. Let's dig in a little bit deeper. So here are a few um, other things that you can consider if you have a little bit more of that time. So there's the three core phases, which is discovery, requirements, and prioritization. So you see the objects, relationships, CTAs, attributes. We go through all four of those for each phase in the ideal world where Time is, you know, time is a gift. We don't really have that, but like, I love to think about what are the, what kind of capabilities do we have? And if we do do all those things, it's like, it's incredible. I have been doing that on one of my clients and it has just been such a game changer because we have so much more information than we ever had before. So object requirements. So I'm just gonna go through, these are just some lists, but these are some other pieces of information that I collect. Uh, if we can do that deeper dive. So for objects, we think about purpose. Why do we even need to have this? And this is more of a question for the stakeholders. Maybe there's a few that you're like, ah, that could be consolidated, or do we really need that? And then they're like, oh no, this is a huge business requirement because of X, Y, Z. Um, another one is definition. How often, maybe hopefully not often, <laughs> are you working on something and you realize people are using the same name talking about two different things. And you're like, oh, well, and everyone's like, what? Wait, why would we do with that? And they're like, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. And then you're like, wait, we're talking about different things. We've been working on this for months. How is this a problem? And yet I see it all the time. So think about, for example, let's say you're working for a flight company, uh, like an airline. And the marketing person's like, oh, well, you know, I've been, I've been calling it a flight. And then the designer's like, oh, well, I've been calling it like a journey. And then the developer's like, I call it a leg. And everyone's like, but it's all talking about the same thing. Now we're, now we're starting to create some problems for ourselves. So a lot of this has to do with, let's clean up the internal processes so we can make a better experience for our customers. How can we expect us to make something clean for them if the inside is a mess? So having a clear definition is amazing. I'm working through that with one of my clients right now, and they've been, you know, they're a really established um, healthcare, uh, health literacy company, like organization. And even just the key things, like they have journal entries and they have articles. And they're like, oh, well clearly one's a journal, one's an article. And I'm like, what's the, what's the difference? And they're like, well, it, you know, well, one's a journal, one's an article, and I'm like, yeah, I, I see that, but what does that mean? <laughs> and they couldn't define it. They're like, you know, just on the website. And I was like, it's not. <laughs> to get to the articles, you have to go to the journals. And they're like, well, they're different. And I was like, it doesn't look like they're different. Can we get rid of it? And they're like, no, 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 we have to have both. And I was like, why? So just even having one definition conversation <laughs> opened up all of these things. And now they're kind of going through this ex existential crisis of a lot of other parts that they're like, I didn't know this was a problem that we had. And I was like, I'm very confused. I don't know how your customers are feeling because they must be like mind boggled. I have been working on this project for months with you and I don't know the difference between this. This is a problem. So 
I'll get off my soapbox. Definitions are really important. Um, examples, ah, um, sorry. De okay, the next one is examples of instances. So, yeah, just so people, it kind of aligns with definitions so people know, hey, when we're talking about this, this is what we mean. So it's good to pull some examples so they're like, oh, okay, that's what you mean, cool. Um, what list do they appear on? What is success criteria? Like, how are you, how is the business measuring that? Who owns it internally? Who is maintaining it? You know, we could build this really cool thing and now no one is set up for success to actually make sure that people use it or if something breaks, who do they go to? And then you know what happens? It does break because things break and there's no one to report it and it just dies. And then all that work is kind of like, eh, we kind of sweep it under the rug and now we have another little mess and then we keep going and then they keep going. And it's not, it's not optimal. Why would we do that to ourselves? Number, estimated number of instances. This is just kind of like a, a helpful thing. You don't have to have it, but if, you know, let's say we have a blog post, are we gonna have a thousand? Or are they gonna have like 20? It might just change the way we think about things, especially from a design perspective. Like let's say if there's only uh, 10 pictures that they wanna show, that might be a lot different than now, oh no, we have like 100. 500 images that we need to show. And I'm like, oh, that, that actually kind of changes the way we need to make it for the customers. And then how does this object even enter into the system? This is more of a UX thing, but it is good to know what does that entry look like? Am I, if I'm a member, do I have to, do I create an account? So then now you have to think about, oh, we gotta make sure they can create an account. Or is the admin adding that in? Because that's gonna change a lot of how that system is set up. Relationships, so the mechanics of how that relationship actually works. So more, just it's more details about how, how it is interacting with one another. The next is the cardinality, sort and filter. So what are the parameters that we are sorting and filtering? Or, and what are the dependencies? If this happens, then what? What are all those conditional logic related to something happening? Um, CTAs, which is the methods, so call to actions, what can people do to those objects? So why did blah, blah, blah take that action? Why did they even want to do that? So, and then when? What is the trigger that will make that happen? Or what's going to happen after they do this? They click, they click this because of what? What are the implications of different decisions that our users are making? So you can start thinking about what that flow looks like from um, from the internal perspective. And then our favorite attributes. Is it required? What are the user's permissions and control? Who even sets those? So we could say, oh, I want this to be private. Who chooses that it's private? Does the admin get to choose that you get to choose? Because sometimes that's the case, especially for like larger SaaS tools where there's lots of different users. This forces us to start thinking about those, uh, those permissions and the privacy and all of that much earlier. So it's not like, oh, we're letting this user see this. this. They shouldn't be looking at this and now we have a whole problem of like privacy, but it's like, no, let's make sure that we have those constraints early on. What are some potential values? Where are those coming from? Conditional logic. Is it relative to the user? So if I'm you know, on an e-learning platform and I say you know, there's 90% success rate for this class, this course, I should stop, not say class, uh, for this course, that's all, all relative to me. But the name of the course is, rel is absolute. Everyone sees it. So just knowing the difference between that information and what relationship it has to the different users and how we need to display it. Um, what type of field and then error message. Um, another thing is prioritization. So that's the last phase. Sometimes you can kind of mix and match them, them. So I always like to add a little bit of prioritization because we can't do everything. It would, it would be so awesome if we could do a hundred of the things that we want to do and the client would be in love. But we all know this is the real world and that doesn't happen. So we got to start prior to prioritizing and killing our darlings. So some questions that I like to do is thinking, what is in scope? 
No more scope creep. Or if it is, how can we move things around so it actually aligns with our schedule? Hey, this isn't gonna work, we need to move that around. Um, so a lot of times assigning in this early stage what is MVP, but also giving space for the ones that didn't make an MVP. So it's like, hey, we're not just backlogging it, don't worry, we will get to it, but this is when. So it can help with when you're putting together your scope because then you can have that conversation with the clients and the designer saying, hey, this is actually how long it would take. This one feature that you want is actually gonna take twice as long as you think we need to move some of these things around. So when we can actually see it, I mean, I'm a visual person, designer, but like when you see it, then we are like, oh, that actually takes a lot longer, okay. So it is just helpful to keep us all aligned. Um, and then where is this all living? So I like to do this in Miro, but you can use this, this is just for the brainstorming part. As I like to use those collaborative tools so you can have a lot of people jumping in and saying, okay, this is how I think this goes, this is the relationship to here. And it's, I found it's really helpful for clients and just different kinds of stakeholders to see, just see it. It's one thing to you know, have the conversation, but because we cover so much information in a short amount of time, we need a place to be like, okay, I, need, I see that relationship. And then what I do is I turn it into a table so it's a little bit more organized. So that's... I use Notion so then you can have more of the connections um, because it's, for me, it's not just a table. For me, you click on the object and then it goes to that page and then it goes to this and you can see the relationship. Then I can click onto the object and it goes here to here. So that's why I prefer to do it um, instead of just like Google Sheets. But you can use whatever t tools you have. You probably have internal tools. Yeah, sky's the limit. Um, okay, so deliverables. Cool, we did your workshop, we did your process, now what? We, you know, we gotta build, we gotta build some stuff. So there's three ways that I think of it as, first, um, design could just take it and start doing their wireframes. So you can just jump right into that. Backend um, developers can start putting together your databases and designers can start just hitting the ground, making the navigation um, and putting together the wireframes. Um, and then, the next one is creating requirements. So this is something that I try to do and I really like to do for my developers is create these kind of requirements. So this is what I showed you before with attributes. I like to put together these requirements for you. And then this is a functional requirements that I create for um, my developers. So I know you have your version of this and I just wanna make it easier so you don't have to come up with it all on your own. So like we have um, the requirement category, the user story, what the requirement is, what phase is it happening, what objects are related to it, um, and then what user is taking that action. Um, and then lastly, this is an object guide. This isn't necessarily like probably as much for you, but I want to show it to you in case you would want to offer this to your clients. So this is something that I make more for those stakeholders who aren't technical. So I have a definition of all the objects that we figured out. What is the definition, blah, 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 who owns it, all that stuff. So they can really look into their process. Um, and then the, I'm not gonna open them all, but these are all the categories of information that I narrow down for all of my clients. So I say, what are all the opportunities that you could do? Um, so what are new features you could think about? Here are ways you could optimize your process. What are the actions, business metrics, all of that, all of that good stuff. So this is just an example of one of the tables that I've created for um, one of my clients. So, and you're probably like, this is taking up a lot of time. Like we, time is of the essence. So what I have to say to that is, yes, it takes, it is an extra thing to add, but it will save you so much time because we're saving time and money on that rework. We're getting people aligned in the beginning. And you can do these things. This isn't like you have to sit down and now months are gone. You can do these pretty quick if everyone's just focused and we say, hey, today we're just gonna crank this all out and you can at least get the baseline of the things that you are looking for to make sure your wires aren't crossed. So yeah, these are the, a lot of different ways that you can like slice and dice it. Um, keep going. So who can do this? You, you all can do this. You're all developers, you can do it. Designers, I can do it. 
Anyone can do this because it's all about just talking about what's going on, what's needed, what's existing. And it's giving a framework to actually have that conversation. Like there's sometimes, oh, we're so collaborative. Collaborative just means we're all sitting on a Zoom call, one person's sharing their designs, some people are giving feedback, everyone is multitasking. Collaboration. This is actually bringing people in saying, hey, here's some sticky notes, add them. I wanna know what your department thinks. What is your department um, prioritizing? And is it the same as what I'm prioritizing? Because we need to prioritize the same. Um, and then me. So um, this, these are some things that I can do to help make your life easier. So if you ever need any additional UX support or OUX and you're like, hey, this is kind of cool. I want to do this. I can help your team do the OUX. I can bring that into your organization and at least add that kind of process for you. Um, I can be more of a UX partner. So you're like, hey, we also need someone to make this stuff after. So happy to help with that. And then, or teach your team. I'm a huge advocate of empowering people to do their own stuff. So if you want me to come in and say, hey, this is how it works, using like an example that you're working on, I love doing that kind of thing so people get it, so people can actually get their hands dirty, and now they're like, hey, we can do this to clean up what we're doing next. So um, key takeaways, we are focusing on business objects, what is in your system, what are the relationships, identify them as early as possible so it's less siloed and more seamless, and then let's bring everyone together Bring all the stakeholders, design, development, everyone in the beginning to save you time from rework, miscommunication, and just going through the motions of, okay, uh, that didn't work. So you are still iterative. We're still you know, getting that feedback loop, but it's just getting more information in the beginning. So it's hopefully a shorter period of time. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna know how I can make this better for you. So um, if you feel I would ask everyone if you want to scan this to give me some feedback, and also I'd love to hear your thoughts on OOUX. Um, anyone who does it will be entered into a raffle for a free consultation with you or your team to go through how this process goes. And yes, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>